Welcome uh, everyone to this uh, webinar on the E3. Uh, my name is Hans Kundanani. I am the uh, head of the Europe program uh, at Chatham House. Um, this webinar is part of uh, a project that we've been doing in the Europe program at Chatham House um, together with DGAP, the German think tank, uh, and uh, IFRI, the French think tank. Um, and it's a project that's funded by the Hans Seidel Stiftung. Um, the E3 as an idea obviously goes back to the Iran nuclear deal or the diplomacy uh, around the Iran uh, nuclear deal during the, the Bush era. Um, so it has kind of a long history um, and there's long been a discussion about whether it could also be used to deal with other issues apart from Iran. Um, at the time when it first emerged, um, the E3 were the three big EU member states. Um, now, obviously, post Brexit, there's a completely new context. Uh, one of the E3 is no longer an EU member state, and that raises all kinds of questions about whether the E3 still has the same kind of function that it did before, and whether perhaps if it does have a role to play, it might be a slightly different role than, than before, um, before Brexit. Um, so that's what we're, we're going to be discussing today. We've just published um, a research paper uh, a couple of days ago, um, written by uh, Alice Bion Galland and Richard Whitman, my colleagues, um, and we're going to use that as the starting point for the discussion today. Um, and the way we're going to do this is that Alice is going to uh, start by presenting some of the arguments uh, in the paper, uh, and then um, uh, Roderick Parks from DGAP um, will give uh, a bit of a response, um, and then Anna Wieslander from the Atlantic Council uh, we'll, we'll, we'll give another response and then Richard Whitman uh, will come in at some point, uh, maybe offer some of his um, thoughts uh, as well. Um, this uh, webinar is on the record, we're recording it, we'll, we'll put it online uh, afterwards. Um, and if you want to ask a, a question, the way we're going to do this is through the Q&A function. Uh, if you write your question uh, in there, uh, and we're going to assume that um, we can invite you to ask the question uh, yourselves, um, live as it were, um, at least with audio. Uh, and uh, if, so if you don't want to do that and just want me to read out your question, then perhaps indicate that uh, when you write your question in the Q&A box. Um, you can use the chat function as well for sort of side conversations, but I'm not really going to be monitoring that closely. So if you do want me to pick up on your question, then please do use the Q&A. Uh, function and we're not using the raise hand function at all. Um, so, um, Alice, uh, why don't you uh, go first and tell us a little bit about the paper and um, uh, what it says about the E3. Sure. Uh, thank you, Hans, and very happy to, to be here today to present some of the research that we've been doing on the E3, which I think is a topic that is talked about quite a bit, but not as studied as um, other formats of European uh, security, defense and foreign policy cooperation. So I think there'll be a lot for us to discuss today. So when it comes to the E3, uh, there are potentially endless opportunities for Europe's big three to cooperate. Uh, but the reality is that the objectives, priorities and constraints of Paris, Berlin and London are less aligned today. And this was actually the starting point for our research. It was to try and understand what role, if any, the E3 could play in 2021. So uh, we asked ourselves, to what extent can the three countries actually de deliver and develop uh, a joint strategic agenda? Do they even want to? Uh, and if so, how should they go about doing that? So I'm, I'm just going to present three main conclusions from the report to, to start the conversation. The first point is that the, the E3 of 2021 is a new proposition. Uh, basically, the E3 of the old days is gone. And the elephant in the room is obviously Brexit, because Brexit means that it's no longer the EU3, so harder to build bridges to EU policymaking. Um, and the current state of EU-UK relations with uh, no foreign policy, security and defense agreement and ongoing tensions does complicate the rationale and the optics of E3 cooperation, which is something I'll come back to. 
Another important change for the E3 in 2021, which is something that I think we should really keep in mind, is the new US administration, because there was a pause uh, during the Trump presidency, and we're now witnessing a certain reinvigoration of meeting in the so-called quad format, which is E3 plus US, mostly on issues relating to uh, the Iran nuclear deal, but also on a wide agenda going from Ukraine, Russia, China, arms control. And this move has been uh, broadly welcomed by, by the E3, but it does beg big question as to the role that the E3 can play within the transatlantic relation, including NATO. And I know that Anna will come back to that. And it also asks question as to whether the rationale for E3 cooperation will be limited now that the US is quote unquote back uh, and that there is maybe less of a need for European to caucus. The second thing that I'd wanted to flag is that paradoxically, Brexit uh, makes E3 cooperation more necessary and more difficult, which uh, is, is indeed quite a paradoxical situation, because while the UK wants to be distanced from EU foreign policy, Germany and France are committed to strengthening it. So the three countries really need to find the right balance between the risks and opportunities of working together, which is specifically what we've been uh, investigating as part of this research. So I just want to say a few words about the positions of the three countries. Germany does think of its foreign policy mostly through the EU and through um, EU partners. So it doesn't want to allow the E3 to either undermine the EU or be a way for the UK to bypass the union. That said, uh, in the absence of an EU-UK agreement on foreign security and defense policy, there is a certain willingness from Berlin to use formats like the E3 to keep working with London, um, even though this is seen as a second best option, and I think we'll come back to that. From a French perspective, uh, Paris is obviously more at ease with uh, flexible intergovernmental formats, and it does value the E3 as an efficient format that delivers, which is obviously crucial for Paris. But French officials also acknowledge that there are limits to what can be achieved in the E3, especially at a time when France wants the EU to step up as a foreign and security actor and as it's been pushing for this agenda of European strategic autonomy and for the EU to just be a bigger player. So where does that leave the UK? So in the UK, there is a clear appetite to find flexible ways of working with European partners, as we've seen um, also in the recently published integrated review. So as long as the E3 does not operate as a mechanism for bringing the UK into alignment with the EU or as a caucus for developing a European perspective to bypass American policy, uh, London is quite open to discussing flexible engagements with, uh, with France and Germany. So what do non-E3 Europeans, which is most Europeans, especially EU member states, uh, think of the E3? And that matters because it has an impact on the E3's legitimacy in Europe. So obviously, most EU member states don't want for the E3 to become a way to bypass collective discussions at the EU level especially if this is a way to ignore the interests of small member states. So there is understandably some resistance and quite strong skepticism, skepticism uh, for an increased use of the format. But on the other hand, and this is where it gets really interesting, there is also a certain interest in keeping the UK engaged in foreign policy, in part to balance the Franco-German uh, duo. Um, and there has also been a use of the E3 format that is a type of E3+, plus, especially in the E4 format with Italy. So I think there is an interesting tension as to whether the E3 can actually work for Europe as a whole, and I'm sure that Roderick and Anna will want to dive into that. Which takes me to uh, my third and last point. Um, which is about how to move forward uh, for the E3 and that issue of the strategic agenda. What's been really clear throughout our research and talking to people in capitals is that none of the three countries is looking to institutionalize E3 cooperation or to develop the E3 brand as an end in itself. And there is also a, a big question mark that remains, which is the future balance between cooperation and competition among the three countries and also between the UK and the EU. But despite those tensions, uh, Paris, Berlin and London do want to maintain the E3 as a flexible and mutually beneficial form of cooperation. They are committed to maintaining those close, regular and informal channels of communications, which will be particularly crucial for London as it's no longer in the Brussels EU circles of uh, discussions and, and policymaking. 
So the three countries are committed to working together in this format, basically when it's when there is strategic added value and political legitimacy in doing so, which is where the tension lies. Uh, and there is clear resistance to the idea of building a proper long-term strategic agenda beyond Iran diplomacy. So what uh, Richard and I identified as the, the best way forward is to identify specific problems that the three countries need to solve together and for which they actually need each other. And in this context, the E3 should perhaps be considered more as a, a working practice rather than a format per se, which was one of the main conclusions that we came to. So the E3 will remain key for Iran-related nuclear uh, war and for crisis management, mostly on the big issues of the day, as we've seen uh, recently on Belarus or on Mali. And beyond that, it's most likely to be used as a format for consultation and perhaps coordination, especially given the lack of EU-UK fora, for example, to discuss security issues from uh, the Western Balkans or, or in the Sahel. And last but not least, the E3 could really be useful to discuss uh, emerging national policy development that would benefit from some coordination. And one example of that is the strategic approaches to the Indo-Pacific, which is uh, sort of the buzzword and the topic that everyone in Europe is talking about now. And especially on issues relating to maritime security, Hong Kong, et cetera, there is scope for productive discussions between London, Berlin, and Paris, and for the UK to work um, alongside the EU, or at least to have those discussions in, in parallel. So I'll stop there. I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing what my colleagues uh, will say and to the discussions. Thanks. Thanks, Alice. Really, um, really interesting, especially on these different perceptions among the E3, of the E3 as a, as a format, um, and, and, and these fears actually, right, that on the one hand, um, the, the German and to some extent French fear about undermining the EU, and then a, a British fear about sort of forcing the UK somehow back, reintegrating it almost um, into EU structures, um, and then also this fear of bypassing US uh, policy, that's interesting. Um, and then also the, the, the specific um, issues that you got got into about the, the, the E3 potentially could could work on. I'm sure we'll come back to some of those um, too. Um, but but Roderick, um, as a as a as a Brit, um, but but working in Berlin at, at the German think tank, um, what's your sense of of, um, of of the potential of the E3 and how it's how it's perceived in Berlin? I guess in particular. Um. I, I'm from the Isle of Man, and I will talk as a as a Manxman in Berlin rather than the Berlin perspective, um, if that's all right. Um, the three points from my side, um, and, and just to start off by, by saying I think, I think it's a very good paper, um, uh, and having uh, said that, I will also say I come at this from a different angle, so my first point is sort of where I'm coming from, because it's a different place than, than Alice and Richard, and then I'll develop that in, in, in my sort of second and third point. Um, so, um, to, to sort of crudely compress your argument, I think it is that the E3 will emerge as a format in the absolute exception um, where, you know, the, the EU um, it cannot be the, the sort of prime vehicle. Um, so you bring in the UK um, where it doesn't damage um, EU action. Um, and that's basically for, for big projects where um, the three countries need to be on their best behavior and, and sort of overcome squabbles between them. And that's, that's primarily a sort of transatlantic lens. Um, and I think your basis for that is a series of interviews that, that you've had with, with officials from the three countries. Um, and the, the Germans and the French have said, as, as you sort of reported there, you know, we are committed to the EU and, and we wouldn't do anything to, to undermine it. Um, and the British say, oh, that's disappointing because we're pragmatic, um, and you know this this sort of ideological position. You're narrowing down your options, um, and my response to that is, you know, you would say that, wouldn't you? But I think it's nonsense. Um, uh, and you know, the, the idea that the UK is pragmatic about formats, especially formats with an E in the title, I think isn't the case. They would think very hard on ideological grounds, as, as Hans suggested, about getting involved in in a you know, anything with Europe in the title. Um, but, you know, beyond that, I think it, the idea that France and Germany are, are fully committed to the EU is, is also questionable. Um, you, you mentioned that, that France is happy going off, you know, with a coalition of the willing and then slapping a European label on it. I, I would really underline that. Um, and I think also Germany, 
you know, I hear an awful lot here when it comes to cooperating with the UK. You know, we, we can't do that. It would undermine the EU. You know, when, when the Czechs ring up and say, would it be all right to expel some diplomats? Um, does Germany think about, um, you know, the, the damage, if it doesn't, to the EU and its relations to other European states? Or does it do what it's just done and balance its relationship to the Czech Republic against its, its relationship to Russia and say, sorry, Czech Republic, no, nothing doing. So, I mean, I can think of a lot of examples in, in European foreign policy where Germany doesn't seem that committed to, to the EU. So for me, this is, you know, my, my starting point, um, I, I think is, is a slightly sort of different one. So point two is, um, uh, you know, what, what are the actual dynamics that, that might draw them uh, together, which, which is not, you know, you would say that, wouldn't you? But the actual sort of political dynamics. Um, and for me, it is not German-French commitment to the EU and UK pragmatism. It's precisely the opposite. It is, it is a lack of German and French commitment to the EU and the UK seeing an ideological advantage of getting involved in European affairs in order to make them look a little bit worse. And funnily enough, I think that's where the cooperation may come from. Um, and we've had this conversation, Alice, so it doesn't come as a huge surprise. But for me, you know, the trend that I've seen over the last decade is France and Germany pulling out of EU foreign policy structures proper. So they've all but abandoned the external action service. When Helga Schmidt sort of up sticks and went to the, the OSCE and it stopped rotating at the head um, between the French and the Germans, um, the external action service has basically been left to the Italians and the Spanish who were brought in by, by Mogherini and Borrell. Um, France prefers to pursue European foreign policy through Michel and through summits in the European Council. And that involves politicizing it, um, creating a crisis, threatening to move ahead and exclude other partners in the EU and threatening a coalition of the willing. And through that, hoping to sort of trigger action from the Germans that they actually do something and the Germans don't play ball they take it to, to Ursula von der Leyen and, and the commission, and you end up with some sort of glum geoeconomic leveraging of, of the internal market and sanctions and so on. Um, so for me, both Germany and France have pulled out of European foreign policy proper and, and, are, and are doing their own sort of, almost sort of unilateral takeover of the, the sort of the big EU institutions. That for me then opens the door for the UK to come in and make them look bad because if, and I'll be interested what Anna, Anna says to this, but you know, the Poles and the Swedes who have no purchase anymore in European foreign policy um, because the external action service is being run by, by Southerners and the big policy decisions are being taken by France and German sort of workmanship. I think now look at the UK um, and the E3 in a way they didn't before and, and think, you know, can we bring the UK in? Um, and they're not saying we need to set up an E3 plus one as the Italians are. They're just saying an E3 is all right because it's better than this E2 that we have. Um, uh, and, you know, if we can bring the, the, the UK in, then it's no longer a fear of a sort of directoire it's actually a balancing against a directoire. So that's what's shifted for me. So that's one of the dynamics I think that, that has changed um, precisely because of a slightly different dynamic that is, is at the heart. Uh, my, my third point, and this will be quicker hands if you're, if you're sort of raising your eyebrows at me, but um, I think for me, sort of the, the next point is that the E3 for me isn't the format that emerged dealing with Iran and the, and the JCPOA. It is, um, a triangular relationship between these three countries, um, of which you know the the action in Iran was was one manifestation. But there is a deeper triangular relationship, and that remains just as vital after Brexit as it did before. It's just got stranger, I think. And and I think the E three relationship will continue, but because. France, Germany, and the UK are bound together. Um, and they're bound together actually not as a triangle, but as three bilateral relationships. 
each sort of, you know, France and Germany trying to bind the UK into European institutions, um, France and the UK trying to drag Germany into sort of security and, and geopolitical action, um, and, and uh, the UK and, and Germany, you know, the economic, geo-economic trade side of things. Um, that was always the sort of triangular relationship inside the European Union. I think after Brexit, that relationship is no longer anchored in the European Union. Um, and I think you'll see each one of those sort of bilateral relationships then sort of developing its own dynamic that will then pull the third partner in. So I think, you know, I think the UK and France will move ahead on security in the Indo-Pacific. And this is this is Hans's sort of um, fear of missing out theory that then Germany says, oh, I don't want to be excluded and, and, and gets tugged in. Um, so, yeah, I think I think that for me is where the real dynamic from comes from. It's it's this strange sort of three sets of bilateral relationships, which which used to be quite cohesive, in the sense that it was about trying to influence the, the direction of EU policy. Now it's no longer about that. It's about positioning Europe in the world. I think, um, and, and these sort of two people, two two sort of capitals each time will try to move apart and the third one will will be pulled in after it um uh, and, and that th these are my thoughts um so i'll stop now i look forward to the discussion brilliant thank thanks roger really um really interesting and sort of a, a challenge i think as as, as well um Especially the, the you know, sort of political dynamics and 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 this gap between rhetoric and reality. I mean, you, you sort of you said you were going to crudely summarise the argument in paper, so I'll crudely summarise your your argument, which is that everybody is doing something completely different in reality from what they say and maybe even think they're doing. Um, and then this this yes, this really interesting point about the deeper triangular relationship between the three. Um, so Anna. Um, the, the role of sort of small member states in European foreign policy has already come up quite a bit and, and, and attitudes among small, uh, small EU member states to, to, to the E3. Give us your, your take. Thank you so much, uh, Hans, and great to be back here. Uh, thanks for uh, here at the Europe program at Chatham House and thanks for the invitation. Uh, and congratulations to Alice and, and Richard for yet another, I must say, interesting and thought-provoking and, and much needed, I think, paper on, on the E3 and the possibilities and, and risks with this format. So uh, for those who haven't had the chance to read it, I really recommend uh, reading it. It's, it's, it's a great research paper. So um, yes, I will focus my remarks on the non-E3 states uh, in two directions, as I thought. One, uh, the big one, <laughs> United States, the transatlantic framework. Uh, and the other one, the smaller European states. So um, I have two, two dimensions of my remarks here. And if I focus first on, on the E3 and the US, the kind of transatlantic dimension, uh, and since also in the paper it is uh, mentioned, uh, this connection between the E3 and the possible European pillar in NATO, um, I will just recap a few of my main arguments from a commentary that I published on on that topic in, in November uh, last year. And um, partly uh, it was part of a process where we had talked about it at Chatham House uh, in, I think it was March the other year uh, and discussed it um, also because I wanted to explore then, you know, what role the E3 could have in creating kind of a European pillar in NATO and I landed into this theme, uh, I approached it by, I was thinking a lot of how to solidify actually the transatlantic relationship in the long term. So France in past years put a lot of emphasis on greater European autonomy and independence. And then you had Germany calling for a stronger European pillar in NATO using that phrase actually, but uh, did not outline at all what that would mean uh, you know, what's the flesh behind that concept in that sense? So uh, when I looked into it, uh, it also became apparent that the first advocator for that such a pillar in NATO was actually the UK already in the 1960s, creating, uh, uh, and I love this, they had uh, Euro T's at NATO. So the, the you know, permanent <laughs> deputy directors would drink tea 
uh, the Europeans and, and chat. Uh, and then you will have dinners with the, with the ministerials, so informal gatherings. And also in the 1980s, you could find quite strong UK arguments for European pillar in NATO. And by then, uh, uh, UK was also a, a member of the, of the EC. So, so you could see this coming together um, uh, with these three. And, and it kind of brought me into to the UK um, or into the E3 format uh, with the UK even though of Brexit, such a dominant actor in the military field in Europe, uh, it seems reasonable to say that if you think it's, it's proper to develop a European pillar in NATO in order to make the Europeans take more responsibility for their own security, but at the same time, not uh, soften the, the, uh, the transatlantic framework, then you cannot do that without the, the UK. You cannot have a an EU caucus within NATO, you would have to have a broader uh, approach to it. Uh, and that's also something that would appeal uh, better to the US, I think, framing it that way. Um, because the signaling then is, is that uh, you, Europe would enter more of a partnership uh, with the US, uh, assume more responsibility and take on the burdens for it. So, so how would the E3 go about that? I think for me, it is a leadership role. And I think this paper also touches upon it. It, it would be the E3 serving a bit as an avant-garde for making things happen, for starting the, the, the processes of thinking about, uh, for instance, a concept like the European pillar in NATO. It's an elegant concept to, to spice your speeches with, but you know what, what's really the thinking behind that? Um, who initiates such a process uh, within uh, NATO? Could it be done by smaller nations? Well, yes, but nothing would really happen without the big ones because they are the ones who, who you know, carry the, the greater responsibility within the organization. So, so in my world, uh, the E3 then could serve to bridge between, so broaden the discussion, it's not only about the EU, but you also cannot do it completely without the EU because you now have this defense cooperation within the EU happening. So uh, best outcome is that that's as congruent as possible with the processes uh, and the capability development and the operational development within NATO. Uh, so if you have that approach to it and, and you're not focusing on what divides or what you know the independence part of things, uh, then you can use these bigger countries to kind of consult. And I was looking at the checklist that uh, uh, Alice and, and Richard made in their paper now, you know, added value and legitimacy, acceptability, and you have you, you go through a range of criteria that could be um, uh, the core of a, of a strategic agenda for, for the E3. I think it fits pretty well because it would be this kind of uh, making things happen approach. But then uh, it comes into my second point then, okay, so if, if the bigger ones agree and the US says, okay, I'm listening, how do you make the other ones come on board? And how do you anchor this in the broader framework among the smaller nations? How do you anchor it with the institutions? And that's, uh, that would be the second leadership role for the E3 as I see it, because you could not just run your own way, it would be a huge backlash, I would think, it wouldn't lead to anything. Really that is the trick then, and, and for of course the UK with its uh, current, uh, uh, the, the government's current, so to say, uh, perhaps uh, an interest in, in, you know, the identifying the EU as a, as a main actor within within defense or the processes there and vice versa, um, since we did not re ever reach a, a big agreement between uh, the EU and, and uh, the UK uh, on defense and security uh, for Brexit, this, this, this could be difficult, but I still think it's, it's very important because there will be a lot of skepticism uh, from smaller states uh, in general to, you know, the fear of getting uh, to lose influence that the largest uh, states decide uh, and that, you know, you're faced with a fait accompli. And the second, the dimension then would be that institutions also lose 
legitimacy and, and force to, to move on. So both undermining the institutions and giving the smaller powers less power. So this, this is certainly an agenda, but then I think I would, uh, I think that there are a few tricks uh, as, as this paper hints on as well. And that's to have it flexible, the format, not uh, the E3 is the E3, it should be informal and work like that. But it, you could of course add on uh, key persons or key countries as, as you need it in order to anchor uh, and move ahead on certain aspects of such a process or various processes as was done with the uh, Iran uh, agreement where, where the high representative was added in order to anchor it within the EU. Uh, in NATO, you could use the Secretary General, for instance. Uh, countries like Italy, when you, as, you, as has been said, when you introduce the E3, Italy would always say, you know, we want to join as well. Uh, and you could do that on an ad hoc, ad hoc basis, as I see it, or other countries, the Poles or the Swedes, but, but not, not, in, not in general, but that has to be skillfully drafted. Uh, and, and to come back to Roderick's point, which I think was very well formulated on, you know, yes, the gut reaction would perhaps be for small states to say, yeah, the institutions are the prime, um, prime uh, forums and that's where we have the influence and so on. But on the other hand, uh, you can see that when a country like Sweden uh, says that, okay, qualified majority voting in the EU, that's actually an interesting idea on certain topics, uh, which we, we just recently did. Then you, that you, can, you, you sense the feeling that uh, the institution is not working perhaps, you know, as you want it to work. So that's a trade-off then. Uh, if you have a, a, a lead uh, that you think is wise enough to, to lead, you're always, you're always also aware of that. You cannot have it all, you know, there you have to focus, you're, you're not big enough to focus on everything. You have to have a few, few gains and it, it would be a trade-off. Uh, you know, what makes the institution work better? Is it that we have solved certain problems that we can take certain positions and then, uh, okay, go ahead, the bigger ones. If you agree and it sounds reasonable to, to us, we back you up. Uh, so that's the dimension of it as well. Uh, and actually, I just wanted to, to finish up with, if you look at the Iran deal and, and uh, the role of the E3 there, um, in the end, when, when uh, the Trump administration uh, left, I mean, it was viewed and felt among many countries, I think, including Sweden as, as the greatest, one of the greatest accomplishments by the EU on the diplomatic, uh, in the diplomatic history of the EU. So it was not really the EU had, who had, you know, made it happen. It was this grouping of countries, but it became, by anchoring it, an accomplishment for the whole institution. And I think that's the way to do it. Sorry, I was that lengthy. Thank you. Great, thanks, um, Anna. So. I want to give Richard a chance to, to, to come in if he wants to, uh, and then I do want to take some questions, but, but just quickly, Anna, just to be clear, so do, do you think that, is Roddick right though, that there has been a sort of shift in um, attitudes to the E3 in smaller EU member states, particularly in your region, I think, um, from a position where they were basically opposed to one where they're basically in favour for the reasons that Roderick described to do with you know, the, the perceived takeover of the European External Action Service and European EU foreign policy by Southern uh, EU member states. Is that something that you recognize? I haven't heard explicitly like, you know, a takeover in, in that regard, but I would say that, you know, as the UK has left and being such a dominating actor for us, a, a very close partner and, and the, the Franco-German uh, axis, you know, uh, being so strong, uh, we, we look at things differently and we definitely are open for basically every, anything, I think, that would keep the UK close to and, and as much integrated as possible into European affairs from a EU point of view. But if though that, that that's the direction in which the E3 evolves along the sort of transatlantic kind of role that you just described, then I'm curious to know what the French would make of that, um, you know, because, you know, famously sort of, you know, the EU, um, you know, the, the, the worry about the UK was that, that the EU would turn it into an American Trojan horse. What you're describing, Anna, could be also perceived as being somewhat of an American Trojan horse, couldn't it? But 
maybe Alice has some, some thoughts on that um, uh, later on. But Richard, did you want to come in at this point? Well, not for too long, I hope, because, um, you know, we've got a great uh, audience who yeah. are listening in. And um, uh, thank you to all of them for, for coming and, and indulging us in terms of our report. And, and thanks also to, to Roderick and, and Anna for their comments. I mean, this is this was for Alice and I what you can call the difficult second album because we did a you know an E3 report last year with with Tom. He left the band uh, and uh, we pressed on uh, uh, with this. But I take from the comments that we you know we were able to knock out a few decent tunes. So so thank you very much. Um, to, to Roderick first, I mean, Roderick, I think, provided a great response to, to the issue that, um, that Alice raised in her remarks uh, about the E3 brand and gave us a strap line, which is better than the E2, uh, which, you know, I think is, is, is an interesting piece of analysis, but I think it's also uh, potentially uh, telling uh, as, to, uh, as to why the E3 may end up uh, having, uh, having legs. Um, so, so I thought that was that was interesting. But I wanted to press you a little bit, Roderick, if I if I may, at some point on on Germany uh, because of where you're sitting at the moment, and and you know whether sort of Germany's geopolitical constipation uh, is likely to be one of the things that sort of causes problems for the E3. You know, France and Britain might want to think big, but Germany may you know end up being the, the sort of more problematic uh, part of that uh, three-legged uh, triangle. And to add into your remarks about the external action service, like, uh, the high rep, and clearly, you know, we, we have a, a high rep uh, who, who's not getting uh, the same sort of plaudits uh, as, his, as his predecessor. And, and do you think that's also something which is sort of driving thinking about uh, other ways of, of operating? Because, you know, the high rep still got quite some time to go uh, in terms of his, his term. Um, and, uh, and and what the reaction is on on uh, some of the member states that you've already mentioned, who are perhaps losing some enthusiasm for the you know the Lisbon Treaty uh, arrangements for for foreign policy. Uh, to, to Anna, uh, I mean, I thought it's you know it's really interesting that you expanded uh, at, at at length uh, on on where we might go or, or where uh, NATO uh, might go and how the E three. Um, sits in that. I mean, my, my feeling there is that it's probably something that's difficult for the UK to, to push on for uh, obvious difficult reasons that anything that it looks like the UK might want to promote that uh, might, um, might pull uh, Europeans away from, from the EU might look a bit, little bit tricky. So I'd be interested as to how you might see that idea evolve, you know, where is it best to come from in terms of uh, initiating and, and pushing that uh, forward, and, and I think your remarks about the U.S. and how the U.S. is thinking about things, and 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 as uh, uh, Alice introduced, our feeling that the Quad has kind of has introduced something interesting, the Quad with the U.S. in terms of giving the E3 a different um, uh, a different uh, characteristic from from what it had uh, previously, the new uh, E3. But, but, but you didn't, Anna, and, and nor did Roderick uh, mention the European Security Council. And, and Alice and I spent some time, you know, thinking about this, how it fits, how it fits into the story. Uh, and all those conversations that we have with the officials that we listen to too closely, according to Roderick. Um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the European Security Council wasn't sort of something that, um, that, that really came into that much play, uh, actually. In fact, well, we did hear more, and it was from, from UK officials who were sort of head scratching and, and didn't uh, really wanted to know what, what we were hearing about what people were saying about European Security Council. So does this fit with what you were talking about, Anna, or do you think it's something that's not particularly compatible uh, to this idea of uh, the sort of European pillar of NATO? Thanks, Hans. Great, Richard. Um, so please do ask uh, questions. Um, I don't see any in the Q in the Q and A uh, at the moment. Um, so um, in the meantime, uh, Roderick, did you want to um, respond to some of those questions that, that Richard asked about um, Germany's geopolitical constipation, which is a great phrase, uh, the most memorable phrase of this webinar, I think. Um, and then also the European Security Council and, and, and a couple of other things that Richard asked about. Um, I I will. Um, yeah. Uh, 
I don't, I don't know how to respond to Richard's question politely because I think the constipation is about to end, but I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to say too much about that. Um, you know, I mean, there's, there's obviously a lot of speculation at the moment about, about sort of the green influence on the next government um, uh, and the line that uh, leading green figures are, are taking on China, on Russia, on Nord Stream. Um, so, I mean, it may be that that the constipation ends. I think in terms of relations to the countries that I think are currently um, sort of worried about uh, the, the direction of, you know, or, the, or sort of German influence within the EU, I don't think that enormously changes, to be honest. If you are Polish, do you welcome a moralizing green government? <sighs> Probably not. Do do you welcome a, you know, a green black coalition which sort of out of habit says the Franco German relationship is an article of faith to us? Probably not either. Um, so I, I don't think the structural problems of, of these countries feeling kind of locked out of a foreign policy changes particularly um and i think i mean i thought what anna said about about qmv and so on was interesting like you know that better to give up a bit of power so that something happens um I, I would share that analysis but i think in this case if it's always the french and the germans that are taking the action i think you know you would say yeah you know, after a while, not this kind of action, thank you. Like, I think your appetite for giving up power for the same old sort of tune, Richard and his album, it, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't think that would hold. So sorry, that was a long answer. The constipation may be ending, but I don't think it, it, it's, it changes the sort of structural issues of, of the sort of malcontents within, within European uh, foreign policy. And the HRVP, um, yeah, I mean, as you know, I was working for the EU when when Burrell was appointed. So I sort of saw those negotiations as they happened. Um, on the sort of French and German side, the sense was, as I said, I mean, pretty explicitly, we no longer care about the external action service. And from the German side, I was hearing a lot. The external action service completely let us down in the migration crisis. Um, it was you know, it was the commission, it was DG Home and DG Near. They went out and dealt with Turkey. They leveraged the internal market. The external action service sat on the sidelines and, and sort of sang moralistic tunes at us. That was no use to us. Um, somebody, I will not say who, said the first think tanker who writes the paper saying the external action service should be closed down will be a hero in Brussels. Like that was the mood. I should probably shut up, but I mean, that was the mood essentially. Um, so, with France and Germany saying, we no longer care about this institution, we put top people in charge, um, you know, Helga Schmidt kept an eye on things, um, you know, her predecessor but one kept an eye on things, um, we don't care anymore, and then Spain appears and says, we want to punch above our weight in the world, um, uh, you know, we want to take on the external action service. They rubbed their hands. They said, you know, fine, you take it. So a little bit sort of Burrell got, got, got a bit of a bum deal there in terms of nobody wanted the bloody external action service in that portfolio. And he came, you know, and he was pushed into it by the Spanish government. So that's essentially where we are, I think. Um, and and I, I no longer fear being sacked, so I can, I can say that out loud. But that, that's what I saw when I was, when I was the bar close in. In, in that process, um, yeah. Thanks, Roderick. Um, it's a couple of questions, um, but either Alice or Anna, did you want to jump in on anything that we've just uh, been discussing? I can just respond to, to Richard's comments if you want to now or later. If you could be relatively brief and, and then we can get a few questions in and I'll come back to you all. Yes. Well, I think I agree on, I mean, it would be difficult for the UK to, to push on, on the European pillar. And I think coming back to Germany, that's, that's where I see that, you know, the, the, uh, the driving force needs to be. But the problem with Berlin is that it would need, I think, energy injection from abroad. 
Uh, and there, where, there is where I see that smaller uh, countries actually could play a role. Just traditional, uh, you know, alliance uh, formation, aligning on the topic. You would have the Nordics, the Baltics, perhaps the Visegrad countries who are all interested in, you know, if you approach it from a strategic autonomy point of view versus the European pillar in NATO, for instance, if, if that is the topic for the E3, they would all be united by, uh, you know, the connotation of autonomy uh, because that signals a, a independence division away from the US, which is not preferable. And secondly, the, the, the illusion, uh, if it goes so far so that there is an illusion that Europe could, could provide for its own security, that's also worrisome. So that's kind of where, you know, the nuances would differ from, uh, as Hans said, the, the French perhaps. But then when I tested this on, on some French colleagues, they said, no, no, no. Uh, Macron has himself that, said that European defense should be a pillar within NATO. And I checked it up and actually that's a quote from him. So, you know, in that way, I think there is a reasonable framework for these countries to, to approach the subject. Okay, Alice, briefly if you want. <clears throat> yes, thank you. Uh, I, I just wanted to come in um, on the sort of E3 as uh, sort of the, a practice maybe more than a format and I think this is really what we wanted to emphasize in the paper because to a certain extent I think right after Brexit and when there was a, a bit of a flurry of E3 activity including as Anna mentioned the first E3 defense ministerial I think there was this impression on the continent that maybe the E3 would be the next big thing maybe they would actually come up with a big strategic agenda, they would have, you know, a, a regular rhythm of ministerial meetings with foreign ministers and defense ministers, and it would become that uh, very formal setting where discussions happen and, and decisions are, are taken and which excludes everyone else. So obviously that's not what we're seeing. And I think this is worth emphasizing because indeed, I think the E3 is in a way part of that trend that we've seen in, e, in European security and defense policy as well, which is that sort of fragmentation and landscape of uh, lots of different formats that are beyond the EU, beyond NATO. You have, you know, mini lateral formats, regional formats, European intervention initiative, etc. And that sort of patchwork of initiative to make sure something actually happens and that there is actually activity and cooperation on the ground. And to a certain extent, I think the E3 plays into that. And what was really interesting is that obviously, you know, French and, and German officials uh, will say, no, 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 the EU is very important for us, but we also know that they do lots of things on the side because they need to get things done and the EU makes it difficult. But I think as Anna was saying, if uh, there is progress on, on QMV and we can get uh, EU foreign and security policy to be maybe more reactive, I think this is very much preferred option, especially for Berlin and, and to a certain extent for Paris as well. So even though right now the reality of the politics don't allow for the EU to be a very useful vehicle for foreign policy, I think it's still something um, that they have in the back of their mind. And in a way, the E3 seemed like a sort of plan B that works well. Uh, but very much, I think, a, a plan B, especially for, for Paris and Berlin. And I agree with you, Roderick, that uh, I think the pragmatism of, of the UK and especially this government when it comes to the EU should really be qualified. And I think this will be the, the next, let's say, battle or discussion to have, which is to what extent is it the EU being uh, inflexible? Um, I think that there is also work for, for the UK to do in finding arrangements to work more constructively with the EU. And this would, I think, go a long way in Paris, in Berlin, in Brussels, and, and in the continent. So I think it's worth keeping an eye on that as well. Let's go to uh, Can you hear me? Here we go, okay. Go ahead. Thank go ahead. you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask um, your kind guest, if I may, uh, your opinion uh, on what's going on and what's supposed to be to go worse uh, when we talk about a relationship with, between UK and particularly France when talking about border security and migrants that now, you know, the good weather is allowing to come um, and we know what happened last year so what do you think about i mean the, the relationship in terms of uh, boards border security thank you great thanks uh, antonella and then uh and that may be one for richard maybe or, or roderick actually as a, as a migration expert um uh, baris jelic go ahead um thank you thank you very much so um very uh, insightful 
contributions and thank you for uh, making preparing this a uh, paper. I was just wondering about the role of the EU and NATO and um, just wondered how the politics of E3 um, would affect the partnership between the two organizations because some of the some of the speakers mentioned um, ad hoc cooperation between the three actors and a more pragmatic approach. But I just wondered how the two organizations will uh, will affect. Sorry, how the um, how London, Paris, and Berlin would affect the partnership between the UNATO. Um, and also maybe just to expand the question a little bit, is the E E three telling as to the role of the EU and NATO as international security providers um, in terms of the future direction? Um, of them. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Barris. And let's have a question from Lorenzo Cladi. Go ahead, Lorenzo. Ah, thank you. I'm muted now. Uh, thanks, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, and my questions are, how does the E3 initiative sit with individual states' attempts to deepen defense and security collaboration? So we know that, for instance, France uh, has launched uh, its own uh, European intervention initiative. Uh, the UK has the joint expeditionary framework. And uh, related to that, how does the E3 address the issue of greater inclusivity in uh, European diplomacy, which has been an issue for several initiatives uh, of this sort in the past, uh, and also at the European Union level with PESCO? Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Lorenzo. And I'm going to throw in a question as well from Luigi Scazzieri from the Centre for European Reform, um, who asks what um, you think about how the E3's issues of legitimacy trans translate across to the Normandy format. Um, Richard, do you want to go first, actually? Um, I was hoping hoping you'd choose the others, uh, but uh, uh, maybe maybe just to to uh, answer one of those questions, which is Luigi's very interesting question about the the Normandy format. You know, the format for the, for uh, addressing uh, the uh, the conflict uh, uh, in uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and you know, I think one of the one of the issues that we think is interesting uh, about the E3 format is the extent to which. Uh, it has the capacity to build out, uh, first of all, and that's a key theme of, of what we, we talk about. So maybe that also addresses the question about Scotland that's in the chat. Uh, it could be E3 plus one. It's one of the ways you handle Scotland. But, but you know, there, there, is, there is also, obviously, uh, there hasn't been a rush on the part of, of France and Germany to, to include the UK in, into the Normandy uh, format uh, and sort of see that as, a, as an E3 initiative. So there is... Also a question about, you know, traffic backwards and forwards into the E3 uh, and out of the E3. Uh, and again, I'd be interested to hear from, from others uh, on, the, on the panel, particularly uh, uh, Germany, Roderick's perspective on Germany, uh, as, to, as to, you know, if, if Germany, you know, struggles, if you like, with some of these big questions, whether, whether France might find it more attractive to see the UK into that kind of a format, or, or, or is it a no-go for something that's sort of pre-UK uh, pre uh, exit, exit from the EU? In other words, is that, you know, you, you can't go back if you like, or you can't um, open up those kind of questions in those formats once the UK is uh, outside, uh, outside the EU. So, but a, but a great set of questions, and I, I, I can see that we're not going to be able to get through all of them. Thanks, Richard, and thanks for answering or at least referring to the Scotland question. Um, Roderick, um, uh, yeah, I mean, any, any of those questions, but in particular, maybe the, the Normandy question that, um, that Roderick, sorry, that Richard just mentioned, um, and, um, and they, maybe um, other formats like, you know, European Intervention Initiative and, and JEF. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not going to answer them because they're because they're too difficult, and they're, and I don't know the field well enough. But I think actually Alice is is yes. or actually Anna, Anna would, would would equally be able to. Um, uh, I I just take the the borders question, um, and and uh, you know I, I won't go into how it will play out, but I you know I I can see the absurdity of us discussing. Um, defence cooperation between, you know, the UK and France and, and the E3 and the sort of gunboat situation um, off the Channel Islands, and that seems very incongruous. Um, but to me, they're completely separate issues, and the, 
you know, the, the gunboat situation is a continuation of EU internal policy by very strange means and is entirely separate from the broader discussion of sort of joint European foreign policy um, and is kept separate in people's minds. So the, the sort of the absurdity I don't think is there in London or France. Um, you know, the standoff in the channel around migration and fisheries and whatever else is about EU internal issues like fisheries, like the Dublin Agreement and so on. It's just an absurd way of carrying out diplomacy. But I think in people's minds, it's entirely compartmentalised and it's possible for defence ministries to, to chat with each other without this even crossing their minds. Um, and they see the absurdity of, of sending a government out a government to deal with migrants in the channel. Um, so I just wanted to, to say that because, I, you know, sometimes it looks strange. It sounds odd for us to be having this conversation. Um, and on this EU-NATO relationship, again, I don't know how to address that simply, but I did wonder when listening to Anna how much the UK would still be in favour of a European pillar post-Brexit. Um, you know, it's, it's your OTs that you mentioned were, were back in the 1960s. Um, and, and the absurd sort of parallel that popped into my head was, was, was Ireland um, in, in the 19th century and Protestants pushing for, for, for sort of Irish independence. And then their situation changing very quickly when it became clear that um, sort of Irish independence would mean them in a minority position. And it sort of strikes me that a European pillar would be the same thing now, now that they're not part of the EU, it would be the EU as the European pillar with a tiny UK minority. So whether their, their support would, would still be the same, that, that's sort of what, what popped into my head when we were talking about that relationship. Um, Interesting. Anna? Thank you. Well, I can comment on, on a couple of them. Um, the EU-NATO partnership and the, if the E3 would undermine the, the formal institutional cooperation, um, I would approach it saying that and I think for this whole discussion, it goes that the E3 countries are leaders within the EU, European context. That's how I see them. Also leaders within the institutions uh, in which they are members now. So, and in that position, uh, and this is the systemic leadership that they have to balance with their national security interests. I think, why should they undermine uh, these um, partnerships for the institutions? Are they big enough to do that? Uh, I, don't, I would argue they are not. Uh, instead, I think it would be in their interests to make sure that, you know, from the NATO perspective, how do you make NATO-EU cooperation work to its best? That would perhaps then the UK especially look at and, and the opposite direction, uh, EU-NATO uh, for the for Germany and France, and it's really up to defining a leadership role uh, for these governments in this regard. Uh, that's how I see it. And by doing that, you also get the acceptance from a broader uh, European states. That and you always have to relate to that. Um, you don't always see it, but that's that's what I would you know propose that you actually work on and improve as countries. Uh, and the, the same goes for the, the various initi initiatives, EI2 and the JEF. And actually, Germany has its own framework nation concept, they call it, and they work with a, a NATO defense planning process. And has a, a, and in each of these, it's a, the big, great power then uh, that gathers smaller countries around it and have this kind of minilateral forums. Uh, and I think it's, it's the same. And uh, what you can say about those and the E3 is that can it help shape that common strategic culture that we often talk about that Europe is lacking? The, going back, for instance, to the Indo-Pacific discussion and what, and what Alice and, and Richard also described in their paper, you know, and Germany's role, a bit reluctant that this, Roderick was talking to that as well. I think that's a, the, the interesting dimension of, of perhaps how these initiatives link to the greater picture. Interesting. So the E3 coordinates framework nations with EII and JEF. That's kind of an interesting idea. Um, Alice, uh, final word to you. 
Sure. So I'd like to come back uh, to, to that issue that Anna has raised about other frameworks. But just before that on EU-NATO, I think uh, what's been really interesting to witness is that throughout the even the Brexit negotiations, there was sort of never a moment when the UK sort of said, well, then, you know, we'll oppose EU-NATO cooperation. I think it's always been quite constructive uh, in, for, from the UK the delegation at NATO and you know officials saying if this is sort of mutually beneficial obviously we'd, we'd want that to to go ahead and it's not a topic that sort of uh, comes up in in the headlines so I think it's also easy to be to be a bit more uh, pragmatic to, to a certain extent when it comes to that and actually EU NATO cooperation is a topic that we identified in the paper um, as something that the E3 could talk about um, as, as one of the the topics so I just wanted to, to maybe conclude and come back to, to the issue of the sort of inclusivity versus ambition, which has been mentioned. And I think um, this is where I do think that the E3 is a little bit distinct from other type of initiatives. We've talked about European Intervention Initiative, the Joint Expeditionary Force, et cetera. Why? Because the E3 is technically the gathering of three countries for no specific aim. So it doesn't have an agenda, it doesn't have a purpose the way uh, the European Intervention Initiative has, has. It's a set group of countries that come together to do something specific, uh, to talk about you know, strategic convergence, um, specific sort of scenario planning with the military attachment, et cetera. You talk about Jeff, it's a specific group of countries that is a joint expeditionary force. When you look at the E3, it's three big countries that can talk about things from the death of uh, Hamal Khashoggi to the Iran nuclear deal to Mali to Belarus. So I think in a way the issue, if we want to phrase it that way, is that the, there is a potentially endless list of things that the E3 could talk about. And this is where I felt the, the reticence from officials and maybe from, from the French who are usually quite at ease with having you know, EU and NATO and lots of uh, flexible formats is to say, well, E3 can be a bit of a slippery slope because if we do engage there, it could be about anything and everything. And for a lot of things, we do want to maintain space for the EU to become an actor. So I think this is where I would maybe qualify sort of comparing the E3 with other formats because it's not for a specific issue. It's just three big European countries that could talk about everything and anything and they would always have something to talk about. So then it's about deciding, do they want to discuss that together or would they rather move forward with another grouping of countries? And I think this is where the reflex maybe for France and Germany is to say, Let's see if we can have an EU discussion. Maybe we'll fail because it often does, but we sort of owe it to the EU to try at least, um, and maybe we can make progress through through the E3. So I just wanted to to conclude on that. Thanks, Alice. I think that's a good a good place to end. Um, one of the things I've gotten out of this discussion is um, two alternative titles for this paper. Um, the first of which uh, was um, Roderick's um, "Better Than the E2." Um, and then the other was Alice's uh, a plan B that works. Uh, slightly sort of underwhelming kind of uh, uh, take on the, the E3, but I think that's I think reflects the the sort of um, the, the sort of nuance that you've brought to this um, discussion. Um, thank you all to the, to the to the panelists. I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't take more of your questions, which all came slightly sort of at the end. Um, but hopefully we'll get another chance to discuss these things, um, perhaps when um, Alice and uh, Richard bring out their third album. And hope to see many of you back with us then. Thank you for coming.